Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Unravel the Exome Odyssey, Overcome the Challenges of Exome Level CNV Detection, presented by Dr. Alka Chabe, Director, Cytogenetics Laboratory, Greenwood Genetic Center, and Dr. Christina Kuzmano Ozog, Medical Geneticist, Children's National Medical Center. I am Alexis Corrales of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our two presenters. Speaking first is Dr. Christina Kuzmano Ozog. Dr. Christina Kuzmona Ozog earned her medical degree at the University of South Florida, where she also completed her training in pediatrics. She then relocated to Stanford University for training in medical genetics and clinical biochemical genetics. She remained on staff for three years before moving to Washington, D.C., where she accepted a faculty position at Children's National in 2011. In 2014, she took a brief hiatus to obtain additional training in clinical molecular genetics through the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Kusmana Ozog is ABMGG certified in clinical genetics, clinical biochemical genetics, and clinical molecular genetics. Currently, she is an attending physician in the Division of Genetics and Metabolism and co-directs the Biochemical Genetics and the Human Molecular Diagnostics Laboratories at Children's National in Washington, D.C. Dr. Chave came to the Greenwood Genetics Center in 2008 as a clinical cytogenetics fellow. After completing her fellowship in July 2010, she assumed the position of Assistant Director at the Cider Genetics Laboratory and was promoted to Director in 2013. Dr. Chabe is responsible for overseeing the routine cytogenetics, chromosome analysis, and molecular cytogenetics, fluorescence in situ hybridization, and genome-wide DNA microarray, testing performed in the cytogenetics laboratory. Dr. Chabe is also currently involved in the interpretation of microarray test results, as well as several research projects at GGC. She is double board certified in cytogenetics and molecular genetics by the American Board of Medical Genetics. I will now turn the presentation over to, to Dr. Christina Kuzmano Ozak and Dr. Olga Chabe. Welcome, doctors. Hello. Um, today, I would like to um, just start by saying thank you for the opportunity to be able to um, show you some of the exciting work that we've been able to do at Children's National, um, specifically um, using the Exxon Array system. I'd like to just start by um, reviewing the importance of copy number variation. As we all know, it is an important determination of human diversity and plays a significant role in disease susceptibility. Generally speaking, every individual has about a 1.2% difference between themselves and the reference genome. In an exact study of almost 60,000 individuals, over 126,000 copy number variants were identified in the autosomal protein coding genes. On average, individuals possess almost one whole deleted gene and almost two duplicated genes. 70% carry at least one rare genic copy number variation. 84% of copy number variants are shorter than 100 KB, and 56 are shorter than 20 KB. Most of these would be missed by traditional SNP array technology. 
The Clinic at Children's National is one of the largest genetics programs in the United States, and last year there were over 7,000 patient encounters. There's a wide variety of individuals and diagnoses seen in the clinic. Approximately 500 individuals were seen for developmental delay, an additional 500 were seen for autism, and about 1,100 were identified to have an inborn error of metabolism. Typically, the evaluation of a patient in the genetics clinic includes the recommendation for genetic testing. And if a specific syndrome is not identified in that initial visit and or the individual is noted to have developmental delays, multiple congenital anomalies, or intellectual disabilities, the first tier test recommendation is chromosomal microarray. This has been um, suggested by the American College of Medical Genetics and numerous other organizations. Molecular genetic testing at Children's National first began in 2013 when we went live with the Cytoscan HD system. In that first year of testing uh, postnatal cases or pediatric cases, um, we ran approximately 800 microarrays. Um, and as been mentioned, this is the first tier testing for chromosomal imbalances associated with intellectual disability, multiple congenital anomalies, and autism. In August of 2014, we transitioned over to the Cytoscan DX system, which is the FDA cleared um, array platform. Again, this is approved for postnatal use in cases of developmental delay, intellectual disability, multiple congenital anomalies, and dysmorphic features. In general, we continue to run eight to 900 microarrays a year, primarily on patients within Children's National. About 20% of the time, we are able to identify a copy number variation, and about five to 10% of the time, we identify significant areas of homozygosity that may be suggestive of uniparental disomy and or the AOH is suggestive of um, parental consanguinity. Once we had chromosomal microarray up and running and comfortably um, in the workflow in our laboratory, um, the next step for us was to go live with next-gen sequencing. We chose um, a different way to approach next-gen sequencing. Um, we do not offer um, full exome sequencing at this point in time and are primarily running panel-based um, testing. On the wet bench side, we treat each sample the same um, and we sequence all of the um, genes associated with known um, disorders in OMM. So in other words, we're running a medical exome and we are taking a personalized approach to the analysis and interpretation by offering either um, panels based on phenotypes and or using um, the findings from chromosomal microarrays where areas of homozygosity have been identified um, to identify a recessive disorder. Additionally, if this test is negative, we allow our physicians to take a second look um, typically um, not inquiring a second charge for this. When we went live with our next-gen sequencing, um, the clinicians um, were very active in um, advocating for the use of copy number analysis as being part of the next-gen sequencing testing. We attempted to validate um, Copy number analysis, also referred to as del dupe analysis, bioinformatically using our next gen data. And we set this up by um, taking our sequencing data through BWA and GATK and generating a BAM file 
and feeding it into the next gene software by Soft Genetics. We are analyzing a sample compared to controls using a hidden Markov model. During our validation, we analyzed 122 copy numbers. 109 had been previously identified, including 66 deletions ranging from a single exon of 50 base pairs to 25.2 megabases. Additionally, we looked at 43 duplications, four chromosome duplications, ranging in a, and the remainder ranging in size from 0 0.2 KB to 30.8 megabases. We were able to verify seven negative samples and a couple of things which we were not expecting included um, four samples where we were unable to detect an exon level copy number and two samples where copy number variations were identified um, although the prior test um, was deemed negative. To focus in on these incorrect copy number calls by next-gen sequencing, the four single exon copy numbers that were not identified included a duplication of DMD exon 17 and the following deletions, exon 10 of ERCC6, exon 11 of Shank 2, and exon 5 of MacBrad 2. The two copy number changes that were not identified by traditional microarray analysis included a deletion of exons 5 to 10 of CHRNA7 and a deletion of exon 27 in L1 CAM. In other words, these deletions were too small to be picked up by the um, traditional microarray platform in our laboratory. Therefore, the results of our validation um, showed us that there are limitations, including single exon copy numbers to be identified bioinformatically with next-gen data, as four of 11 of these cases were not identified bioinformatically. This led us um, to the conclusion that we would need to have additional confirmation of copy number calls if a copy number call was identified bioinformatically. And the options include using a second platform, such as the Exxon Array system, or a secondary method of calling CNVs, such as a Bayesian model. The Cytoscan Exxon Array platform was available for us to first test in April 2017, and training was completed in October of 17. Cytoscan Exxon Array kits are now available for purchase. Kits can be used with the existing Thermo Fisher scientific equipment. As I've mentioned in our lab, we have been running both Cytoscan HD and Cytoscan DX, so we had all of the necessary equipment ready to uh, bring this test into our laboratory um, simply by purchasing the additional reagent kits. Additionally, we were able to establish a workflow so that the um, med tech currently assigned to prep Cytoscan DX assay on a weekly basis is also able to prep the Cytoscan Exxon Array at the same time. This has also allowed us to do this testing in-house with no additional use of FTEs. One of the first things we looked at um, was the incorrect copy number calls by NextGen, and we were actually able to identify these calls with the Cytoscan Exxon Array kit. So looking at the four single exon copy numbers that were missed bioinformatically, um, the DMD duplication and the three other deletions, um, we were able to identify these with the Exxon Array Kit. Um, in the slide, you will see a screenshot of the MACRA 2 deletion and Exxon 5. I'd like to now go through a couple of case examples. Um, and this is, um, Specifically, this is a case of an individual with maple syrup urine disease who was identified shortly after birth. Uh, maple syrup urine disease is one of the classical inborn errors of metabolism that results from um, an enzyme deficiency and the inability to break down the branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Treatment for this condition is lifelong, and 
will either be by reduced protein intake, special metabolic formula, and or liver transplantation. When this individual was a adolescent, they were evaluated for transplant. And at that point in time, molecular testing was obtained to try to identify the underlying molecular diagnosis in this individual of maple syrup urine disease. In MSUD, there are um, four different genes that create three different subunits that go to make the entire enzyme. This individual had all four genes sequenced by next-gen sequencing, and a single variant in the DBT gene was identified. There was no second hit in this gene identified, and there were no additional uh, variants identified in the other three genes known to be positive for MSUD. We were able to take residual sample and run the cytoscan exon array, um, specifically um, then looking at the DBT gene to see if we could find a second hit. And in this particular situation, we were very excited when we identified a single deletion of exon 2. One of the things um, unique about working in a children's hospital with um, testing being done um, almost exclusively on the patients within the hospital is that we were able to have um, good knowledge of the other um, patients with these disorders and or other molecular diagnoses within our patient cohort. There have been several other individuals with maple syrup urine disease um, who have been found to have deletion of exon 2 within the DBT gene within our patient population. However, those individuals were noted to have homozygous deletions of DBT, which were easily identified um, by the next-gen sequencing. So it was really exciting when we found this heterozygous deletion, as it had been missed by our bioinformatics del dupe analysis. We then looked at some proficiency test samples and specifically, these are samples um, for the gene N colon 1. Um, this gene is responsible for a condition known as mucolipidosis type 4, which is a recessive neurodegenerative lysosomal disorder characterized by intellectual disability and ophthalmologic abnormalities. There are two founder mutations in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, uh, one being a missense population and the other being a 6.4 kV deletion, um, which is responsible for disease in uh, approximately 95% of individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. In this screenshot, you can see the two proficiency samples, um, both having deletions of exons 1 through 6, um, with some minor variation between the two samples in the size of the deletion. Next, we evaluated um, several Coriel samples. Um, and I should note at this point in time that there was one sample from Coriel that we were not able to um, identify the deletion um, by any means. Um, so that would include not only this exon array system, but also the Cytoscan DX system, our next-gen sequencing system, and our bioinformatics del dupe system. Um, we did contact Coriel um, to notify them that we were unable to confirm the deletion, um, and they had informed us at that point in time that they do not um, confirm the molecular results of the samples that are in their repository. Um, and so we um, went ahead and, and did testing of several different Coriel samples, um, in part to test out the exon array platform, and in part to ensure that the Coriel samples we had really truly had the um, deletions that um, were listed. Um, in this particular sample, this is a Coriel sample from a 35-year-old female with short stature and matalum deformity. Um, additionally, um, she has several affected family members, including 
a daughter with um, Larry Weil syndrome. And here you can see a deletion of most of the exons of the shox gene, but not all of the exons. Um, one of the things I would like to point out with this sample is um, up here in the upper right corner, the total number of calls. Um, when we first started doing exon array, I was um, somewhat uh, hesitant over the possibility of having several hundred um, calls to be made per sample. Um, however, I was reassured um, in the first run, um, as most of the samples have about 30 calls, um, which is typical for um, a, a patient sample in our laboratory using the Cytoscan DX system. Additionally, the probes um, are clustered into the exons, and clinically significant genes are at the level one um, tier. There are four tiers total, and there is the ability to um, alter the filters of the system um, with the default being level one um, analysis. But should that analysis be negative, there is an opportunity to expand out to level two, three, or four to look at other possible um, copy number variations, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Um, in our laboratory, since we're only sequencing um, genes that have known clinical phenotypes, um, most of our evaluation of samples through exon are looking at the tier one or level one. Um, the next Coriol sample that I would like to show you is that belonging to a nine-year-old male with methylglutaconic aciduria. Uh, neutropenia and failure to thrive. Um, this is a syndrome known as Barth syndrome and typically results from alterations of the TAS gene. Uh, this is located on the X chromosome. And what you can see here in this screenshot is a total deletion of the TAS gene. The final example that I would like to show you belongs to a 22-year-old male with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy who was diagnosed at age 10 with calf hypertrophy, progressive muscle weakness, and toe walking. And what you can see here is a single exon deletion of exon 45. And so these are some of the um, early examples that we have um, from bringing this um, system into our um, laboratory. Um, we've only been running since October um, and have not yet um, validated or brought this into um, actual use. So this is still very much in the research setting in our laboratory. And our um, proposed uh, strategy for moving forward is um, to continue to evaluate patients in clinic. Um, and in that initial evaluation, if a genetic disorder is not identified and or the patient is noted to have intellectual disability, multiple congenital anomalies, or dysmorphic features, we will continue to offer and run the Cytoscan DX assay as our first uh, tier testing. Should that testing be negative, um, we will then move on to next-gen sequencing um, either by a panel or phenotype-based um, review of the data. And if a variant is found in a recessive condition that is appropriate for the patient, we will be able to run the cytoscan exon array to see if we can find a deletion or duplication uh, to provide that individual with a second hit. Um, this could be demonstrated by the case I shared with you of the individual with the exon 2 deletion and DBT. Additionally, um, when we are running next-gen sequencing, if a del dupe is found bioinformatically, we will be able to verify this um, call using the exon array. Finally, some individuals we'll move on to whole exome sequencing when no um, 
disorder is identified. Um, oftentimes in the clinic, we are left with um, the results of whole exome sequencing identifying one variant in a recessive disorder with no second hit. In this situation, we would be able to use the exon array to follow up the whole exome sequencing to ensure a del dupe was not missed on the other allele. So thank you for your time today. And I'd also like to thank both the Children's National Rare Disease Institute, Division of Genetics and Metabolism, where the individuals are evaluated for genetic disorders, as well as the Children's Molecular Diagnostics Lab. It is amazing to be in a children's hospital where we have both a robust clinical operation and laboratory operation and are able to feed off of each other. So thank you for your time. Um, I am one of the directors of the Cytogenomics Laboratory at Greenwood Genetic Center. Um, and so I'll be um, talking about how we are using the Cytoscan Exxon Suite at Greenwood Genetic Center with some examples. Uh, here are my disclaimers. So um, as Dr. Cosmano uh, just mentioned, that in a postnatal genetic workup, uh, chromosomal microarray has been recommended as the first-line test by a number of agencies, such as uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Neurology, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and other agencies. What that essentially uh, pertains to is that if an individual comes in with developmental delay, intellectual disability, multiple congenital anomalies, autism, dysmorphic features, and seizures, then what kind of testing should be done first? And chromosomal microarray made the first aligned test. Now, this has been going on since 2010 when these agencies recommended this uh, testing as the first line test. So at the Greenwood Genetic Center, we have been running microarray since 2008. And we have um, a, a nice tie-up with our molecular lab and to kind of complement molecular testing and cytogenomic testing. So if an individual comes in with developmental delay, intellectual disability, or multiple congenital anomalies, since we have an FDA-cleared assay, which is the Cytoscan DX assay, we do run those samples on this assay. If we uh, identify a pathogenic microdeletion or microduplication, that essentially ends the diagnostic odyssey of that patient. However, if we get a normal or a variant of uncertain significance results, then those individuals are um, have to have additional testing done to identify the genetic cause of their disorder. If a patient comes in with clinical symptoms such as autism or seizures or some kind of connective tissue disorder, uh, then we have the non-FDA cleared assay at uh, GGC, which is Cytoscan HD, and those individuals are run on that platform. And again, we have the same kind of pathway that if we do find a pathogenic change, uh, pathogenic deletion or duplication, then that diagnostic odyssey for that patient ends over there. However, if, though, if we do not have a, a positive or pathogenic finding, and if we have a variant of uncertain significance, then those patients may be subjected to whole exome sequencing or other gene sequencing panels. Now, uh, as you can see on the right side of this uh, graph, um, if those, those patients, whether they were on the FDA-cleared assay or on the non-FDA-cleared assay, whole exome sequencing on a platform that is used at Greenwood Genetic Center includes almost 5,000 genes. And uh, those, that is called the clinical research exome. And based on that, we can have a, um, a single gene a variant finding or single nucleotide variant, short indels. However, to complement those genes, we had to have a custom del dupe array, which we kind of designed based on all our short panels, like connective tissue uh, panel, autism panel, XLID panel. And those were run as a complement with our NGS panels uh, to identify a del dupe 
especially for an autosomal recessive disorder, if we only identified one change by sequencing, or to look for a deletion or duplication for an autosomal dominant disorder where we only found, uh, where we didn't find any changes by sequencing assays. So this is essentially how the cytogenomics and the molecular genomics lab at Greenwood Genetic Center tie up together and work uh, towards uh, providing services to these patients. So, but in terms of doing a del dupe assay to complement gene sequencing, uh, we have a number of challenges uh, for the actual setup. So we had a number of MLPA assays, and uh, for those of the labs that have experience with this, you can uh, realize that every run, first of all, requires several controls. And um, it's actually a per exon assay, so that means that the cost can vary by the test. And it's really not comprehensive for a, a number of gene panels or lists. So it has its own advantages and a number of limitations. If we look at a custom del dupe assay, which is what Greenwood Genetic Center had till we got Cytoscan Exxon, so one of the biggest challenges is that with new literature and new findings, the list of medically relevant genes are growing. So that means that these custom designs need to be kept updated. We need to add more genes. So what does that happen for um, a laboratory developed test in a cap clear setting, which is one of the uh, criteria of a diagnostic lab in the United States and uh, elsewhere. So that puts a significant validation burden for new designs. And of course, then that also uh, hinders the lab management and efficiency because how many times are you going to do a validation when you have a, a platform that has another 10 or 100 or 200 genes added to it? So that was one of the biggest challenges why we were not ever able to update our 725 gene list for the past four years. Then another uh, assay that we tried to validate was the medical research exome array, which was a one million array, which only had copy number probes on it, did not have any SNPs on it. And when we tried to do our mini validation, we found that it had an uh, exceptionally high false positive rate. The other thing was it was very expensive. So if we are trying to provide a del dupe assay to complement our next gen panels or our um, whole exome sequencing, it, it turned out to be a pretty expensive uh, assay for the lab and would have put a significant burden on the patients and families that needed this testing. The other thing was that even this assay is not totally future proofed. So what does that mean? So that this assay also only had roughly 4,600 genes on it. So what happens when newer genes are identified and are associated with disorders? Then again, what kind of validation or development that is needed over there? So given the limitations of the different um, assays out there available for labs to validate, uh, one of the things that we have to really realize is that um, an array is really useful to detect exon level CNVs. And as you just saw from Dr. Kuzmano's um, uh, talk, that even though you can have nice um, NGS or whole exon sequencing algorithms to pick up deletions, duplications, or CNVs, um, we still have a lot of false positives and false negatives. And so a whole exome array ideally um, has been reported and shown by different studies that it can be an extremely useful tool to confirm the findings uh, by whole exome sequencing. And especially for autosomal dominant disorders when next generation sequencing is negative, or autosomal recessive disorders when we have only found one change uh, by sequencing. Uh, and also, you know, on an exome array, we want to be able to reliably detect single exon CNVs because they could be the, the causative reason, reason uh, for the genetic etiology of a specific disorder in a patient. So with this background, um, where what we wanted to see was that where next generation sequencing and microarray complement each other. And so Cytoscan Exxon Suite, uh, was 
a big path forward in terms of development uh, for the array content and design. And uh, we at Greenwood Genetic Center were fortunate to be involved from the beginning in terms of what kind of gene panels should be on it, what should be the coverage, um, how many probes at a minimum would be needed. And uh, I have to really applaud uh, the Applied Biosystems or Thermo Fisher's team that the way that they selected the 6.85 million best probes, um, which includes 300,000 SNP probes, was empirically selected to determine a copy number response. And so the other big advantage of this platform is that this covers almost 26,000 genes. And as Dr. Kuzmano mentioned that, you know, you saw in some of her graphs, as I will show you too, that level one through level four are how these genes are classified. So level one genes, which is almost 7,000 genes, are essentially the ones that are omimorbid morbid genes or genes associated with specific disorders, intellectual disability, autism, other metabolic disorders. And then the level two genes are those genes that have a ClinVar entry. And level three are other OMIM genes that may or may not be associated with a specific disease or disorder. And level four are the genes that have RefSeq, UCSC, and ensemble entries. The other big advantage um, of this uh, platform is that when the probes in the target exon were being designed and developed, uh, it, was, it was decided that the level one genes, which have the highest clinical relevance, would also have probes in the flanking regions of the target exon, whereas the other level genes may will have uh, at least a lot of probes in the target exon may or may not have flanking regions covered. So this was also very helpful in terms of looking at some regulatory regions or some five prime, three prime UTR regions that could or could not be clinically significant for these selected genes. So in terms of um, uh, validation and how this whole development was taking place, what our observation was that Cytoscan exon had a lot of fewer calls compared to the medical research exomery. So if you look at this table here, and there are five samples that were compared on both Cytoscan exon and the MRE array, what you can see that the total number of calls were two times less on the exon array as compared to the MRE array. Now, in terms of a clinical lab, in terms of a diagnostic setting where we have to report these findings, it becomes extremely important to have a number of calls that we can be confident about. Now, you have to understand that this is not an, uh, an apples to apples comparison because Cytoscan Exxon has 26,000 genes and the MRE array only has 4.6 thousand genes. If we do an apples to apples comparison, which is on the right side of the table, what we see that the number of calls are 11 times less. So if you uh, go back to my point, as I was trying to explain in terms of false positive calls on the other platforms, this was a, um, a huge benefit to the lab in terms of resources, in terms of confirming these calls, and in terms of providing this information uh, to our referring clinicians and families. So we were extremely happy with uh, uh, the development and this data set. The other thing is that uh, for the labs that are already using uh, the platforms uh, available since 2010, uh, as was the case at Greenwood Genetic Center, uh, we have the software which is provided by Thermo Fisher, which is Chromosome Analysis Suite. And you saw some snippets in, in Dr. Kuzmano's talk, and you can see that it is extremely uh, easy uh, to use the software. And it has been updated for the interpretation of Cytoscan Exxon data. And as I mentioned earlier, we can do just a tier one to tier four analysis and not look at other genes or gene panels or gene sets if you're not interested in that. 
The other thing is that we can easily create bed files uh, of, of select genes that we are interested in, and we can look at those target genes and restrict the view of only those genes that we are interested in and not look at other noise or other you know, calls that may or may not be clinically significant. And another feature is that if next generation sequencing or whole exome sequencing has been performed on the same patient, then we have the opportunity to integrate the VCF file to look for combined viewing. So um, as we've just seen, based on the development and validation, Cytoscan Exxon Suite has one of the highest resolutions with increased coverage available in the market today. It contains 6.85 million probes, of which 6.5 R copy number probes and 300,000 R SNP probes. This is extremely important as we saw in one of our validation samples that the SNPs can show us mosaic uh, loss of heterozygosity or mosaic UPD in a constitutional setting. Secondly, this is one of the most superior future uh, proof design because now it covers 26,000 genes for deletion duplication detection and has almost coverage of 7,000 genes of the most relevant genes associated with genetic dis disorders in clinical research. And just the inclusion of SNPs for the identification of loss of heterozygosity, absence of heterozygosity, sample identity, and the ability to perform duo and trio studies is extremely beneficial and helpful too. And the flexible analysis that we can do in the software now uh, to look at single or multi-exon level deletions or duplications, or to look at specific panel or gene lists, to look at our data for the specific phenotype that has been provided to us in terms of the patient is also extremely uh, useful for a lab setting. So now I'd like to uh, switch gears and show you two research cases um, that we ran as part of the early access study. Uh, the research case one is a Wardenberg syndrome uh, pedigree, which you can see on the bottom left, right, left uh, side of the slide. And you can see that um, there, the pro band, which is shown with the arrow, is this fetus, which is affected. So this was a fetus um, on um, exam at 32 weeks. And on ultrasound at 32 weeks showed fixed limbs, uh, scalp edema, and micronathia, which is a small jaw. And you can see that on the fetal exam, uh, this was a stillborn, uh, this fetal exam, the fetus had white hair, had small palpebral fissures and uh, ears, and also had a cleft palate, which you can see in the middle photograph, uh, the clefting in the mouth, and had excessive nuchal skin, which is around the neck. Um, and had four limb pteresia, syndactyly, uh, absent palmar creases, and uh, some other uh, genital abnormalities. So the, the clinical phenotype obviously was uh, Wardenberg syndrome. And um, on this slide, you can see this is the mother of the affected uh, fetus, and there was another affected male child who had deafness and skin pigmentation issues. And you can see this iris heterochromia. You can see the, the uh, blue colored um, iris in one of her eyes. And so if you look at what is known about Wardenberg syndrome, there are four types of Wardenberg syndromes, and there are different genes that have been associated with those syndromes. Um, so the first thing that we did was we ran this, uh, this specimen on our HD microarray, and we identified a large deletion on chromosome 22, which includes the SOX10 gene. So you can see that SOX10 gene uh, is responsible for almost 15% of Wardenberg syndrome type 2 cases and almost 50% of Wardenberg syndrome type 4 cases. We did run the um, Wardenberg syndrome panel uh, of five genes, and we did not have any um, single nucleotide variants. We did run whole exome sequencing, and we did not have a finding. So when we ran this case on Cytoscan Exxon, what we saw, what, what you can see on the, on the top part of the array image is this large light red deletion, and with those heavy red boxes, it is showing us a nested homozygous deletion. 
So we did do a qPCR studies and we tested the parents and we saw that the mother was the carrier of the large deletion and the father was the carrier of the smaller deletion. And both of them are uh, affected. And of course, the fetus with the biallelic deletion was the stillborn, which has uh, more severe features. We have submitted this uh, case report for publication to American Journal of Medical Genetics, and it is uh, pending acceptance right now. So this was really extremely interesting that now, not only do we have the ability to pick up large deletions, but we also have the ability to pick up nested homozygous deletions. The second case uh, that I'd like to share is, um, again, a very interesting case that has been followed up at the Greenwood Genetic Center by our uh, founder director, Dr. Roger Stevenson. So this is the case of a female um, with A. calvaria. And, um, and you can see that father and one sister and one half sister were affected. So what A. calvaria means is that um, uh, almost lack of the skull bones and the, and the neighboring uh, muscles. And you can see that usually this is associated with some kind of craniosynostosis phenotype. So the facial appearance looked like cruzon craniosynostosis. And what we saw was that the posterior parietal and occipital areas of the calvaria were not ossified, which you can see in the X-ray image of this case. So we, uh, this case was also subjected to a craniosynostosis next-gen uh, panel, and we did not have any findings on that panel. Uh, and all the genes on this panel were fibro, uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor one, two, and three genes because they have been associated with uh, craniosynostosis phenotype. We did run a whole exome sequencing, and we found benign variants um, are some variants, but they were also present in the uh, paternal sample, so they were excluded. So when we ran a cytoscan exon as part of early access, what we found, uh, so this is the FGFR4 gene, and it's really, really amazing that you can see the deletion of these log2 or these copy number probes over here, which is in the three prime UTR, and this is a partial exonic deletion. So we weren't very convinced that this is a real finding, but we did do quantitative PCR, and uh, it confirmed and um, by qPCR, and we are now pursuing this further because FGFR4s have not been associated with craniosynostosis uh, findings in the constitutional setting. And although it belongs to the same family of genes, we think that this is a valid finding, but we need to do additional studies to um, determine the functional significance of this finding. So these are two important cases. As we were doing our validation, uh, we decided that we also have a hereditary cancer NGS panel at Greenwood Genetic Center, which contains 44 genes. And uh, of those 44 genes, um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are on it, and some Lynch syndrome and familial polyposis genes. And as, as part of this panel, copy number uh, determination is extremely important because there are some known BRCA1 deletions duplications uh, that are pathogenic. So we, we used four samples and we um, put them on cytoscan exon suite. As part of the analysis of these 44 genes, we, we found that all the genes had more than 150 probes per gene. There were no gaps in any exon. So we performed this mini validation and uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 aberrations were confirmed. And you can see in this table that all partial gain of BRCA1, exon 1 to 19, or an entire gain of BRCA1 with a partial gain of BRCA2, exons 1 to 3, or a large two copy gain of BRCA2, all of these cases were 100% concordant with our previous findings. And so this was something that we did on the side, but really benefited the lab in terms of um, a, a targeted analysis of an NGS panel in terms of del dupe analysis. So how does this work? Um, so the first step is that uh, on the right-hand side, you see chromosome analysis suite, which is the software which is used uh, to visualize the array data. 
And when you click on the sample, you can open the array results and you can see that there are 47 calls. And when you click on the uh, open target list of genes, we can specify the target list of genes here. In this case, it was 44 genes that we were looking for. And when we filter according to those gene lists that we are interested in, we see that only one call showed up. And this was a blinded analysis. And when we look at that, we can see, well, it's a, it's a, um, it partially includes the BRCA gene, even though the duplication is large enough. And we can zoom in on the gene and even just look at the gene of interest and, and not look at the call, which is in the adjacent area also. So these are some unique features which will be extremely helpful in reporting. If we look at, um, so how has this made this complete uh, story different in terms of a GGC molecular cytogenomic setup. So if you go back to my first slide, now I've removed the compartments, and now the compartments uh, show that our del uh, array, which was off of a select number of 725 genes, is now being replaced with Cytoscan Exxon Suite, and we hope and predict that we will be able to provide answers to phenotypes and patients and families um, and end their diagnostic odyssey. In summary, um, in our experience and um, just looking at our experience with this platform, we have this future-proofed um, platform, which can be a huge adjunct to whole exome sequencing and other next-generation sequencing panels for reliable deletion duplication determination. Um, extremely easy to use um, and same software for those labs that are already using uh, Applied Biosystems or Thermo Fisher's platform. And it's a similar assay, and as Dr. Kuzmano mentioned, no increase in an FTE, and we can uh, very uh, flexibly uh, slice and dice the data to look at the genes or panels that we are interested in. One big benefit also that we've seen is that this uses a very little input DNA, as low as 100 nanograms, which is considerably less from 250 nanograms that we were using earlier. And this has been uh, kept cost effective and cost neutral, which is, which is something that, you know, as a user and a customer, uh, we need to thank these, uh, the provider and the vendor. Um, and because then this does not put an additional burden on the patients and families that need this testing. And an exceptionally lower number of calls than other platforms and other assays that we have struggled with in the past. With that, I would like to end and, um, and I'm open for questions and comments. Uh, what you can see on the left left side is the photograph of all the GGC employees, and this is our Greenwood Genetic Center Treatment Center building. And on the right-hand side, you see the GGC Cytogenomics Lab, and we were all wearing blue for Autism Blue Day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chave and Dr. Kuzmana Ozog for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is going to be for Dr. Kuzmano Ozog. Have you tested any mosaic samples with this new platform? If so, what have you found? Thank you for this question. Um, we have not yet tested any mosaic samples with the Exxon Array platform. However, we do have several residual samples of mosaic um, trisomies identified using the Cytoscan DX platform that we should be able to test the system with. Question number two is going to be for Dr. Chabe. Have you looked at known pseudogene region, PM? PMS2 or MSH2, et cetera, and what are your findings? Um, thank you for this question, too. Um, no, we have not looked at these pseudogene regions yet, but when, when we start running our hereditary cancer panels, we anticipate that we will be able to have a little bit more experience with these genes and try to figure out uh, a real call 
uh, in the gene versus the pseudogene, but right now we don't have any experience with this. Dr. Kuzmano, how many probes are you using to make your calls? Um, so we have not um, altered the filter settings. Um, we're using the standard settings um, that came with um, the software. Um, when we um, open up a sample, we are identifying between um, 20 and 60 calls in a sample. Um, and thus far, we've only run um, samples where we um, had targeted um, deletions or duplications to look at. Um, so we've we've pretty much gone in and identified the the target that we were looking for, um, and and have just sort of played around a little bit with the additional calls. But we've not um, analyzed a sample. Um, blindly or without a specific indication. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Dr. Chave, how does the number of calls you see on the Exxon array compare to others you've used? Of those, do you find that you're able to validate more of those calls on one array over the other? Um, yes, actually, as I was showing in my slides, that the number of calls on the Exxon array were 11 times less than uh, the other platform that we tried to validate at Greenwood Genetic Center, which was a huge number of decrease in the false positive. So that's the first part. Um, in terms of validating those calls on one array over the other, so as you can imagine, having 11 times more calls and trying to validate those, most of those would turn out to be false positives. We were not able to confirm by any other methodology. On the other hand, if you look at my FGFR4 case, it was a partial exonic deletion of the last exon, which is the 3' prime UTR, and it had very few number of probes. And even though the software did not make that call, but you can just see that during visualization, we saw the decrease in the log two ratio, and we were able to confirm that by qPCR. Any positive result that I have shown in the two research cases and the other cases that we have at DGC, we have been able to confirm by quantitative PCR on the exon array versus the other platforms where we had majority being false positives. Thank you again, doctors. Do either of you have any final comments for our audience? I would like to recommend uh, any diagnostic lab running uh, microarrays as a diagnostic or a validated LDT that they should definitely consider using the Exxon, um, Cytoscan Exxon suite as a complement to the next generation sequencing panels. That's my recommendation. Hey, um, can I just uh, chime in and answer the uh, mosaic question? I'd like to give a comment. So as part of the early access study, we did um, have a sample where we were able to identify a chromosome 6P UPD, uh, mosaic UPD uh, on the Cytoscan Exxon suite. So I can confidently tell you that just having the SNP probes on this platform is a huge advantage to be able to identify isodisomies and also mosaic UPDs, uniparental disomies. Perfect. I would like to once again thank Dr. Christina Kuzmana Ozak and Dr. Alka Chave for their presentations. I would also like to thank Labroots and Thermo Fisher for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I'd like to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through July 2018. You will receive an email from Labroots alerting you to when this webcast is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.